for this conference, God. God, we say yes, Lord. As a church, Lord, we say we want to be equipped, Lord. We want to be ignited, God. We want to be more on fire for you, Lord. We want to step more into that which you have been inviting us to, Lord. We have heard the whispers of the things that you have been promising us, and we want to step into those, God. Lord, as we sang today, Lord, heaven coming down to earth, Lord, and we say, Lord, let it land with its full impact, God. Come, Lord, we say more, Lord. Lord, we even now begin to prepare our hearts and our minds, Lord, for this conference, Lord, as we say yes to you, Lord. And Lord, I just pray for Nigel, Lord, as he comes, Lord, and he speaks, Lord, the word that you have given to him for our church, Lord. And again, Lord, I pray, Lord, that that would just be ignited, Lord. Put a fire upon that, Lord. Stir our hearts, God. Lord, open our hearts that we won't just come with, we're just coming with a listening mode, Lord, but we come with hungry hearts, wanting to hear what you are saying to us, God, as a church. Give us the confidence and the faith to step into all that you are inviting us into, Lord. In your mighty name, amen. Morning, everybody. Wasn't expecting to come up and do communion at that point, so I suppose I've said morning already, but anyway, morning. <laughs> Just going to have a bit of uh, housekeeping, cleaning up around here. Um, it's great to see you, and it's great to be with you, and uh, you may remember that at the start of the year, I sort of alluded to sh- um, sh- God sort of talking to me and to us as a team about what he wanted us, what 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 he wanted to do and what he wanted to say and how he wanted us to proceed and to pre- what he wanted us to press into this year. And I also told you that I would let you in on the secret towards the end of uh, January. Well, actually, I was going to do it next week, but it seems like this week is a good week. Let me, um, this is called Multiply, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, 2019, if you can remember that far back, it felt like a real pivotal me- year for me. It was my 50th birthday year, so it was quite a natural time for me to uh, reflect on where I got to in my life. Um, It was, um, I've been a believer all my life. I've been actively serving in the church since my, since one church, in one church or another, since my teenage years, apart from my years at uni, which were a little bit drifty. But other than that, um, I've been leading in one way or another in Birmingham Vineyard since my early 20s. And then uh, it was coming up to a decade that Joe and I had come here to um, move and be the senior pastors of Winchester Vineyard. And, so, and in those previous four or five years, I would say that I had been on quite a significant personal journey as well in terms of my own emotional health, my own security and identity in God, some of which I've shared about publicly. And I was reflecting on all of this in 2019. And I felt like God was beginning to talk to me about our church and about the next season, about what it would look like to continue. Because, you know, sort of 10 years seems like a natural time to stop and reflect. And at the start of 2020, that's where I was, reflecting on where we were at, what God was saying to us as a church, what, what does the next season of life at Winchester Vineyard look like? God has been so good to us, you know, in, in many, in as much as you could tell, if you looked from the outside, we seem like quite a, in quotes, successful church. We're warm, we're welcoming, we're friendly, you know, it seems like the Lord's presence is here, um, there's incredible generosity in this church and faithfulness. And I was asking questions of the Lord, like, how do we make sure that we don't settle inappropriately? How do we make sure we don't get too comfortable? What would a healthy, what would healthy growth look like in our context? And, you know, we're part of a church planting movement. And in fact, James and Lynn, I think Lynn's here, I've seen you this morning. James and Lynn were beginning to gather in Southampton and get ready to launch what would become Solent Vineyard. And I was asking the Lord, what else have you got for us? We're a gathered church here. We represent many communities. How does God want to impact those communities with the life that we experience here on a Sunday morning? Healthy things grow. Healthy things grow. And I was tentatively exploring this word growth, and I was thinking about multiplication, and I was just saying, Lord, what would that look like here for us? And how might we plan and prepare for it? It wasn't an urgent thing, but it was an important thing. And I was just getting into that at the start of 2020. And then, as you know, the pandemic hit. And we all went into lockdown. And suddenly we were in a season where we used the word unprecedented a lot. And everyone's life was impacted. And most of us were at home most of the time, juggling work and homeschooling with going for walks 
uh, with one other person if we were allowed to. And some of us thrived, but many of us struggled, if we're honest. And we were really glad to get, get through that and get back to some kind of normality. And like most churches, we had to change the way we did things. It seemed like every three months we had to change the way we did things. And we needed to switch to online services and car park church. And we had to follow the rules. And then we had to, the rules changed. We had to follow those rules. And, and to be honest, it felt like all we could do, all we could manage to do, was put one foot in front of the other and try and find creative ways to stay connected to God and stay connected to each other. And so for two years, my reflections and my thoughts about the next season of church and the whole sort of growing and multiplying thing just sat on the back burner as we just tried to deal with what was in front of us. And then last year, in the wake of the pandemic, 2022, uh, we were prayerfully assessing where we were at. We felt very strongly that God was talking to us about renewal. And in fact, renew became our word, our theme for the year. Renew in our personal walk with Jesus. Renewal of our community life together. And our relationships. Renewal of the Holy Spirit. And renewal of our understanding of calling. And as part of that year, you guys in the church were very kind enough, very kind to release Joe and I to take a sabbatical, which was very, very renewing for us. And as we were preparing for that sabbatical, I had this thought in the back of my mind. We're planning, you know, what's going to happen while we're away. And then we were trying to think ahead a bit and plan what would happen when we came back. So we weren't suddenly, you know, sort of stressed out about that. Um, And I was sort of saying, I had this niggle in the back of my mind. I wonder what it is that God wants to say for 2023. I wonder what he wants to do. And should I be thinking about that and praying about that while we're away on sabbatical? Which was a bit of an annoying thought because honestly, I just wanted to rest. Um, It was a bit of a dilemma. But actually, the Lord was very kind. We were in a meeting one day. We were just chatting about stuff. Uh, I think Paul was there. I can't remember if some of the other team were. And I felt like God just whispered to me. Now, I didn't actually hear an audible whisper. I had a thought, but I knew that it was, I felt like it was the Lord. And he just went sort of, by the way, the word for 2023 is going to be multiply. So I was thinking about renew and I was thinking how helpful it was to have one word that kind of took us all the way through the year because it's easy to remember and it's easy to concentrate on. And the Lord was saying, by the way, it's, next year it's going to be multiply. And I thought, oh Lord, that's just so kind of you because I wrote it down and I did a bit of a brainstorm and then I didn't really think about it for three months while I was on sabbatical. But we've been praying and since we've come back, we've been praying. And we're asking the Lord, what is it that you really want to do in this church? What is the next season about? Now, um, oh, I've left my clicker there. So sorry. Can you pass me the clicker? Thank you. Um, Multiply means to increase in number or quantity. Synonyms that you might want to use are augment or enlarge. And when I started to think about multiplication, I actually thought it's... You see multiplication throughout the Bible. Throughout the Bible. You've only got to look in the first chapter of Genesis. Literally the first chapter of the book. It says, God blessed them and he said to them, this is, this is a man that he's just created, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the birds, the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and every living thing. Multiply, that word multiply, rubber, it means to become great, to become many, or much, or numerous, to increase, to extend in number. And it seems that the, the, the instruction to multiply is also linked with God's blessing. God's original design from us, for humans, was to be made in his image, to be his representatives on earth, and then to rule over it. Not to exploit the earth and satisfy our own greed, but to use the resources of the earth wisely and govern them with the same sort of responsibility and care that God has. But his instruction was to multiply. It's there in the first chapter and in God's original design. You you read about multiplication when God talks to Abraham about the nation of Israel. He says, surely I will bless you. Surely I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand. I mean, that's a lot of offspring. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So again, there's multiplication and there's blessing. And that's one example, but you can find that, that kind of idea throughout Genesis and Exodus a little bit. And you can read a little bit later. It's not up there, but it says, this is um, Genesis 47. It says, thus 
Israel settled in the land of Egypt and they gained possessions and they were fruitful and they multiplied greatly. So God did it. He promised it and then he did it. You can look ahead to Jeremiah after Israel has been um, taken out, as it were, exiled. And another promise that Jeremiah, God gives to Jeremiah, I will gather the remnant of my flock and I'll bring them back to their fold and they shall be fruitful and multiply. So God did not forget or change his mind about his promise to multiply and bless his people. Then we look ahead to the New Testament and, the, and the, the miracles and the parables of Jesus. You know, the very first recorded miracle that we have of Jesus is, is a multiplication miracle. He goes to a wedding and he makes wine. How extraordinary is that? Another recorded miracle we have of Jesus is, is the feeding of 5,000 with loaves and fish. And in both of those cases, there was plenty left over. This is generosity. This is our God's creative generosity. Um, Jesus talks about multiplication in several of the parables that he tells. I don't have time to go into it, but Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. That's the smallest of tiny seeds that grows into the largest of trees. He talks about the kingdom of God being like yeast or leaven, as uh, some translations talk about it. And he talks about taking one small sort of sample of yeast and and, um, mixing it into flour enough to make three measures of flour. Now, three measures of flour in biblical counting means enough bread for about 100 people. This isn't just one or two loaves. This is multiple loaves. This is a tiny amount of yeast to make a massive amount of bread. He talks about the power of the sower and how the seed that fell on good soil um, grew and grew and multiplied a hundredfold. He talks about the parable of the talents, where he says, invest what you have and see it grow. In other words, multiplication is part of Jesus' ministry. And in fact, we read that Jesus multiplied disciples. We read about him first sending out 12 disciples and then later sending out 72 disciples to preach the gospel and to do the works of the kingdom. And you can read those stories in Luke 9 and 10. Jesus sent them to villages and towns all around where he was to multiply the ministry of the kingdom. And then at the Great Commission, right at the end of Matthew, we see that Jesus instructed all his disciples to go and to make disciples, to multiply disciples, teach them everything I've taught you, and you've got the authority, now go and do it. It didn't stop with Jesus, though, because then we get into Acts, And uh, the word of God, or you could also call that the kingdom of God, multiplied through Acts. This is four verses in Acts. And Acts is the story of the early church, actually the whole church exploding and multiplying and starting in Jerusalem and then growing out. And you can see those different verses through Acts. The word of the Lord increased. The word of the Lord multiplied. The word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. And then it increased and prevailed mightily. And the the whole, I mean, if you... If you're lacking encouragement, read the book of Acts. It's all there. The history of the church. How God took a small amount of people and literally exploded them. A little bit like the way that Steve Nicholson was just talking about on that video. When he said the Holy Spirit's doing it. When the, when the Holy Spirit is doing something and we're trying to work with that, we see God, we see fruit, we see things expand, we see things grow. And then very lastly, for this little journey through the Bible, um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, preached the gospel, planted churches, and multiplied leaders. And this is just one example of something he wrote to Timothy, one of his church planters, and one of the guys that he trained. He said, the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust those to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So in other words, Paul was in the business of multiplying leaders. Multiplication spans the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And multiplication is also part of our story. It's in our DNA as a church. It's in our DNA as a movement. I don't know, but some of you have been around this church for a long time and you know this story, but I'm imagining looking at that many of you don't. Um, And so I prepared um, a very, very crude family tree of our church, okay? Um, this is, um, in 1987, a couple called John and Ellie Mumford, that's them up there, the black and white photo. 
Um, they looked a bit younger in 1987. Um, <clears throat> a couple called John and Lee Mumford were called by God, having trained with the vineyard, uh, with John Wimber in Anaheim for a couple of years, to come and plant a church in southwest London that would be a church that would plant other churches, that would grow in the, in the things of the kingdom and would multiply itself. And actually, I don't have room on this page to show all of the church plants that, that came out of southwest London Vineyard, but there are a lot. Okay? Um, there's uh, Oxford, Bristol, and South End, just off the top of my head, but, but there are others. Um, a couple called Hugh and Ginny Cryer. That's them in the sort of get a room kind of photo. Um, <laughs> Hugh and Ginny, Joel, they joined Southwest London Vineyard. The story goes that Hugh and Ginny moved to London because they wanted to be part of this new church. They were exploring church leadership themselves. Um, Hugh had come out of the Navy. Um, they'd been living in Petersfield somewhere in that area. They'd, they'd not long become believers. And they were exploring church, church leadership themselves. Um, and, and what happened apparently is they turned up at John and Ellie's doorstep in London, knocked on the door. We've heard that you've started a new church and we think God's told us to come and be part of it. And when John Mumford tells this story, he says, and they were carrying the most enormous Bibles you've ever seen. <laughs> And John consequently said to them, okay, you can be part of it, okay, but not the first group, you can wait till the second group. So they started some groups, this church grew, the number of small groups grew, the number of leaders grew, Hugh and Ginny joined, and they served there faithfully for six years. And then in 1994, Hugh and Ginny felt called by God to move from London back to Winchester, to this area, but they hadn't lived in Winchester before, okay, and to start the Winchester Vineyard, which began as a small group, in their house, about half a mile from here, just down Chesil Street. And some of you were here. Who, who was around then? A few of you. Great. Yeah, some, you were all a bit younger, aren't you, back then, weren't you? because <laughs> some of you were children, I was going to say. <laughs> Including you, Lisa. <laughs> no, just, te just teasing. Hugh and Ginny started a group that started groups, that multiplied disciples, that multiplied leaders in small groups, and met publicly, actually, I'll come back to that slide, but I just prepared this one, met publicly around the city in various places. This is the house that Hugh and Ginny lived in, in Chesil Street, um, and these are other places where the church met as it grew. There's one that isn't available anymore because it was an old pub that got pulled down, um, but that's the, uh, the council house, the university lecture theatre, and the community centre at Badger Farm, all places where we, Winchester Vineyard, met publicly before we got this building, um, and then obviously bought the warehouse. Oh, yeah, and as we're doing a little bit of um, looking at old photos, I thought you'd like to see these as well. Here's some photos of this building before... Yeah, we had it, and that's the opening there. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Do you know it was a body and paint vehicle shop? That's what this room was. Um, anyway, going back, they bought the warehouse, they expanded it, a load of stuff happened, and in 2001, uh, they planted out, I think it was 2001, I'm guessing on my dates slightly here, it was around that time, they planted out Arthur and Sarah, who were the assistant pastors here. Arthur and Sarah went to Plymouth and planted a church in Plymouth. And then to complete the journey, in 2020, when we planted out James and Lynn to Solent. Hooray! Hooray. Hallelujah. Multiplication is in our DNA. Multiplication of disciples, multiplication of leaders, multiplication of ministries and small groups and church plants and churches. Um, and while all that was going on, this very young couple here were also part of a vineyard church. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe. I didn't tell Joe I was putting this one up. <laughs> this was the... Um, th this was, we, we used to lead the children's ministry in our church, and this was the, uh, the photo that was on the board that you could come in, because this was before the days of, you know, the internet and things. In fact, it's so before the days of the internet, I thought you'd like to see this photo of a flyer that I found. I think that's from 1992. Okay, you can see the amazing graphic design that's gone on there. Um, there were three small groups and uh, a celebration at the Apollo Hotel in Birmingham with the speaker, John Mumford, leader of South West London Vineyard. Um, our story was such that... Um, oh, hang on. That bit's closed itself up. For me, at the time that I joined Birmingham Vineyard, I was 22, and the church that I joined had 30 people in it, in two small groups, planted by two brothers who were the same age as me 
and had been 17 and 19 when they'd first started the church in their parents' house in a small group. Now, while I'd been at uni, playing in bands and figuring out who I was, and they'd been planting a church, they'd been leading three small groups every week and attending Bible college, and the vision that they had was to grow and plant other churches across the region and beyond. And I got involved in 1991, and I immediately, pretty much immediately, within a month, I heard them say, we're here for a minimum of 20 years. We're here for a minimum of 20 years. He said, we're not here just to sort of a stepping stone to something else. We want to plant a church that grows and plants other churches, that grows and plants other churches. And I was well up for that. And I called up and I said, I'm in for 20 years. We came here just over 19 years later was when we uh, moved here to Winchester. Um, Basically, that happened. They had a vision in 1992 or 93 to plant 10 churches by the year 2000. It was pretty crazy, and we talked about it and prayed about it a lot. Paul and Katie were part of the same church at the time, and that actually happened. 10 churches got planted over the next six, seven years, some of, and, and some more since. Some of them, uh, one or two of them didn't, didn't kind of pan out long term, but all of them got planted. And multiplication of leaders doesn't always lead, sorry, multiplication doesn't always lead to church planting. In fact, there are many leaders around the vineyard who were part of our church in Birmingham back then. And over the years, Joe and I were forever asked, actually, every time we go to an event, somebody would say to us, so when are you guys going to plant a church? And for us, we just didn't feel like planting was what God had said to us. We felt like God had asked us to stay and help, so we stayed and helped. We planted, we led small groups, we planted new small groups, we developed children's ministry and led that for over a decade, as you can see, that's our children's ministry pose. Um, We ran holiday clubs, pioneered youth events, got involved in writing and producing worship music, frankly did most jobs in the church before God called us eventually to move here to Winchester to become succession pastors to take over from Hugh and Ginny, which we did in 2011. Both Birmingham Vineyard and Winchester Vineyard and plenty of the other vineyard churches around were part of a movement that has been multiplying disciples and leaders and small groups and ministries and congregations and churches for over 35 years The current stats in the UK and Ireland are that we have 121 churches in the vineyard movement, plus 22 sites. By sites, I mean um, additional sort of congregations that are part of a bigger church. So on any given Sunday, there are vineyard worship gatherings in 143 locations. And with the current church plants planned, by next year, it'll be over 150. And as I said, James and Lynn were part of that story, planting Solent just a couple of years ago. So why am I telling you all of this now? Why is God talking to us about multiply? I'm not here to make some massive announcement this morning, but it does seem to me that this is what the Lord is certainly saying to me, and I think he's saying it to us, to press into multiplication and growth. And so in order to do that, I felt like I had to, we have to start that process. And to start that process feels like a step of, multipli- of obedience. This isn't just a history lesson. I mean, I love our history. It's, it was, it's formed my life for the past 30 years. I could talk about it forever, honestly. My wife will tell you. My family will tell you I bore people silly with the, with the history of our, our movement and our churches and what God's done. But actually, it's, this isn't just about the history. This is to learn from the past and go, there is so much more in the heart of God for us as a church to see and to do in his name. And that's true for each of us as individuals And it's true for us as a church family. And you might be thinking, oh my goodness, you know, COVID was really tough and I really haven't got over that yet. You know, what are we going to talk, what's he talking about multiplication for? Why do we have to think about growing and moving? You know, I'm just ready to chill out. And I would understand that. I'd really understand that. And we thought COVID was bad enough and then 2022 happened. Do you know what the Oxford, uh, the leaders know this because I told them yesterday. Do you know what the, uh, shh, if you know. No, that's a silly thing to say. The Oxford Dictionary word of 2022 was permacrisis. Permacrisis. It would be understandable looking at everything that's going on in the world to think, oh my gosh, can't we just go to church and just like, just chill out and rest in God's presence? And that would be lovely. Except that I think God's doing something. 
We haven't even told the story about Alpha, but we've got 15 guests on Alpha this term. We just heard a brilliant story about God's healing. It feels to me like the spiritual climate around here is getting warmer. It feels like there is a sense that God is stirring. You know, our compassion ministry is growing. We've had, I keep coming up here and telling you about amazing, generous gifts that we've received, and we've just had another one. Do you know, last year, we invested, and this was, this was quite a decision for us um, as trustees and as leaders, but we took about £4,000 and invested it in the process of writing for funding bids. And we paid a consultant to help us set that up, and then a couple of people on our team have been brilliantly, faithfully writing off, just looking for um, funding from people who, want to, who share the same vision as us around our compassion ministries to help people who are in need. £4,000. I honestly prayed that we'd get the four grand back. Because then I could look the trustees in the eye and say it was worth doing. So far, at this point, for this coming year, this year that we're in now, we've had £28,000 given to us. Which is astonishing. It's just the blessing of the Lord. It feels like God is doing something across the church. Why is that happening now? The best answer that I can think of is that we've just been showing up faithfully. We just kept coming. Faithfulness means you just keep coming. I'm here most weeks. Have been for the last 10 years. Sometimes it's a drag. (laughs) You probably don't believe that, but sometimes I feel like I have to drag myself out of bed to come to work. You all feel that sometimes about work. But most of the time it's a joy. And just because we keep showing up, I think God keeps showing up. So... Why am I telling you this? What does this year look like? Well, our first couple of Multiply series are coming up. It's going to be uh, next month, we're going to be looking at building resilience. And in March, we're looking at generosity. And then the rest is just a kind of rough list, a big list, a long list. I don't know if we'll do all these things, but these are the things we've been thinking about. That God wants to multiply prayer and hospitality and generosity and kingdom impact and justice and mission and the supernatural and the prophetic, which is why we're doing this conference. But really, this is what I think God's agenda is for us. That through all that, we would multiply disciples, multiply leaders, multiply small groups, multiply communities, multiply ministries, and multiply churches. I said to you at the beginning that we have people who come to this church from like 30 minutes drive away. Maybe maybe a a bit more. And some of you are those people. And you, you live in, you come to church here, but you live in communities that are separate to this place. And I have a sense that God wants to bring life into those communities through us. I don't know what that looks like, but I think it's on God's heart. Something else that God's been talking to us about is um, a a center of excellence for training. Um, We're going to hopefully ramp up our intern program starting this summer. I'm looking for about 10 people to come and give one or two days a week and just learn and grow in the context of being trained for ministry and being trained for leadership. Now, I'm imagining that most of those people would be uh, in the sort of young adults sort of life stage, but actually, they don't have to be. They could be anybody, absolutely anybody. If that's something, that feels like something you'd like to do, come talk to me afterwards. We'd love that. We've already had some, we haven't advertised it yet. We've already had some people applying. And I'm going to be coming to some of you guys and saying, by the way, have you got a spare room that you could put up a young person in? It's quite expensive to live down here. I'll talk about that another time. I don't know exactly what all of these programs and strategies look like, but I do know that God wants to do something. So how do we start? It starts with fruitfulness. You know, I've just been saying that the the last few years have been about faithfulness. And God does say, doesn't he? Well done, good and faithful servant. Faithfulness is an incredible, commendable thing to be. Just to keep coming, just to keep going, to keep walking with Jesus, that's incredible. But Jesus doesn't just talk about faithfulness. He talks about fruitfulness. Oh, I pressed the wrong one. My bad. That one. Jesus said this, it's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. The disciples of Jesus, the people who are following Jesus, 
are fruitful people. And what we're looking for is faithfulness and fruitfulness. And what does that look like for us? It maybe looks like our relationships personally with Jesus deepening. It looks like knowing and loving him more. It looks like our character growing and changing. It looks like the fruits of the Spirit being demonstrated in our lives. Love, joy, peace, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. My friend um, has a, a shorthand phrase for that, and it's this. It means choosing to be the most mature person in the room. That's not always an easy choice. But when we choose to live our life with Jesus, we get involved in his kingdom adventures and we sign up to a life of faithfulness and fruitfulness. And then we get to see what he wants to do. My prayer for us as a church is that we would be fruitful. For some of you, you're listening to this and perhaps you've only been around here a few weeks and you're thinking, well, this sounds good or this sounds like hard work. (laughs) I'm not quite sure what. If this is your church, then I would just love you to think and pray about this. What does it mean for me? How is God talking to me about multiplication? What does multiplication look like in my life? I'm not talking about some grand strategy. One very simple thing that I just want to close with is this. And again, if you've been around here any time, you'll have heard us say this. But if you're part of this church, we don't make you sign on a dotted line. We don't have a formal membership system. We have a functional membership system. And members of this church function in certain ways. And if you're a member of this church, then we'd be looking for you too, and we'd expect you to do these things or be working towards them. And one is to worship with us on a Sunday. One is to join a life group, make some friends, do community together. A third one is to become a host by joining one of our teams. You know, as you can see, it takes a lot of people to make church happen every week. We need people all the time to do the car park and the door and welcome people and put chairs out and to get involved in worship and music and to get involved in leading and helping our children and young people. And if you've been here a few weeks and you haven't had a chance to join a team yet, we'd love to talk to you. We always have opportunities for people to serve. And you know, apologies if you've heard me say this before, but there's two things you can be in a church. You can either be a guest or you can be a host. And if you're a guest, then you're very welcome and we'd love you to stay as a guest for as long as you need to. But if you get to the point where you've decided that this is your church, our encouragement is to stop being a guest and become a host and help make it possible for other people to be be guests here. And don't skip over the... No, no, do skip over. Don't pause in the middle. Because somewhere in between guest and host is a word that I don't like using, but I will use it, and it's consumer, okay? And we don't do consumers in this church, okay? If you're here and you know that God has called you here, jump in. Help make it happen. It's, not, it's a lot more fun anyway. Become a host. Buy in by giving financially. Want to talk to us about that? We'll chat, chat about that, and we're going to talk about that in March. We're going to go into generosity in, in, a, in a bigger way. You know, um, invite others to experience Jesus' love and power. Why don't we stand together and why don't we just invite the Holy Spirit? Because I feel like He has some things He wants to do as we consider these next steps and what He's calling us to. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. You're so welcome here. You're so welcome here. And we have plenty of time. We don't have to sign our kids out yet. There is space to respond to what God is saying, to receive God's love and power, to receive ministry or prayer, if that's what you would like. Let's just hold this space for a minute as we say, Holy Spirit, come. We welcome you here. Now come and speak to us and come and move and come and do whatever you want to do. Come in this place. I can see that many of you are doing this already, but my encouragement for you would be to open your heart up, and maybe the way to do a way to do that, phys- demonstrate that physically, is by opening our hands, just as if we wanted to receive something that the Lord wanted to give us, and just having that open posture and saying, "Come, Holy Spirit." 
He's here now. He's ready to touch and bless and empower and anoint his people. His presence is here. Holy Spirit, come and rest on your people. And fill us, we pray. And quicken to our hearts the things that you want to say to us. Welcome your presence. Welcome your presence. Hello. Um, God reminded me of a, a picture that he spoke to, through to me quite a long time ago. So we lived in the mountains in Central Asia, a um, stunning place. And we'd spent an evening um, watching a video about the Aga Khan, whom the people there worship. And um, he was uncannily um, a human living now, kind of very similar to Jesus, proclaiming to do the same kind of things. And, and we were there to, to be a picture of Jesus.